all right so basically you all don't have to make any notes in cb2 so as such you all don't have to maintain any uh, personal notebook because everything is there in the compiler all right so you don't have to maintain any uh, kind of notes or materials for yourself everything will be given to you just that when you receive uh, your compiler so how many of you have received the compiler just raise your hands so you all have to get that compiler every day in the class just the compiler where the notes are there, where the notes is there uh we'll just mark a few things i will not be using the compiler in class i will be just making and using white board and i will be giving you writing few pointers so no need of making your own notes that is not required at all you all just have to underline some portions or maybe if you want to write something important you can write it in, down in the compiler itself right so it is very simple for you all no notes just what i have given that is more than enough now what you ha you all have to do after every class is that my every class duration will not be more than 1 hour because we cannot study eco economics for more than 1 hour it becomes boring after uh, some point of time micro economics is still fine macro sometimes it becomes boring right so what we'll do is uh, in my class after i teach you some particular topic you will go back home uh at any point of time maybe end of the day or any time when you're getting just half an hour also just read the compiler all right and when i ask you all to solve the questions mcqs and question and answers you all will solve those things because in cb2 it is very important to read the compiler which you have got that notes comprehensive notes because the more you read the compiler the more accustomed you get with the mcqs all right now first let us understand the structure of the entire cb2 uh syllabus that we have so basically cb2 syllabus is very simple it's a 100 marks one day 3 hours 20 minutes paper for those who are giving from ifoa for those who are giving from iea it is 3 hours 30 minutes all right 3 hours 30 minutes why when it's online when it is offline again for uh iea it will again be maybe 3 hours 15 minutes right so now those who are appearing in the july attempt for you all it is 3 hours 15 minutes only all right if you all face any problems in between please raise your hands or mention it in the um uh, chat uh, uh, chat box yes unnati and vanshika you have raised your hands acha for the material all right okay so first let us understand the first let us understand the uh, structure the paper pattern so basically you will get 26 you will get you don't have to write anything you just have to see what i am doing okay so cb2 paper pattern 26 mcq questions each of 1.5 marks each how much it is 20 39 marks is only for the mcq so you can understand 40% of the paper is mcq so we'll be solving a lot of mcqs in my class and trust me when i say this for july it is 3 hours 30 minutes yes uh, when i am saying this all my students they always score more than 35 out of this 39 there are a few chunk of students who may maybe not attending the live classes or maybe not practicing they get less than 35 but if you are getting 35 greater than 35 in the 39 marks you are just half way there right and then you just have to get maybe more 35 or 30 marks to just clear the paper and obviously we are not here for clearing the paper we are here for getting good marks right so this is your 26 mcq questions 1.5 marks each there is no negative marking right and in the mcq you just have to mention a b c d the option uh, number a b c d you don't have to mention whatever is there within the option that also we don't have to waste any time while typing right the next thing is maybe uh, there are approximately 10 uh, small question and answers of around 2 to 4 marks or maybe sometimes around 6 marks also so i'll write it 2 to 6 marks uh so basically around 41 marks of uh short answers two long questions two long questions two long question and answers of 10 marks each so this becomes 20 so in total it's a 100 marks paper now the major concern is this is something which you don't have to be worried about the mcqs why because mcqs is what i will teach you and it is 
and i am always confident in all the terms that when i am teaching you mcqs you will not get any single mcq wrong unless and until you are making a mistake right so that is my guarantee to you all on day 1 itself now these are the portions which we have to work on because it's a, it is uh, answer construction you will not get a direct question right in cb2 especially when the paper is online you will never get a direct question like what is the functions of central bank maybe hardly one or two questions will be direct otherwise all the questions will be indirect they will give you a small case study line and they will ask a question on that so it will not be from any one particular chapter it can be from different chapters from unemployment from gdp so different chapters and uh, generally this is one question which all the students will ask is which chapter this question is we cannot understand this, this can be referred from five different chapters yes in cb2 you have to refer each question from different chapters it cannot be from one single chapter right so that is all about question and answers and paper pattern very simple and one thing which we have to make strong from day one is the mcq and how we can make the mcq portion strong by reading the compiler more and more because if you are reading the compiler again and again you are actually making your concepts strong right so this is the entire paper pattern now let us understand uh, what are the different what are what is the different things that we'll study in uh, cb2 so basically um, it consists of three parts the paper is consisting of three parts when i talk about part 1 so this is on your market and market structures right so demand supply and different forms of market like Uh, perfect competition uh, monopoly and all these things will come under part 1 which is i think chapter 1 to 9 all right so this is the easiest yet the scoring yet sometimes difficult portion of the entire cb2 why sometimes difficult because students take this portion granted they will say that okay this is very simple portion i will not study this i'll study this at the end moment and then you get some difficult or tricky questions from mcqs and question answers over here short question answers and you screw up this portion so this is simple yet a portion from where you can actually get tricky questions right so this is something which we'll actually skim through very simple very interesting also then comes the part 2 which is actually when you have studied market market equilibrium market structure then we'll study about market failure where market fails to attain equilibrium and what is the simple macro economic environment right macro economic i'm not writing the full thing over here you don't have to copy paste anything this is just an introduction which i am giving you and this is chapter 10 to 15 right so this portion is where we will study where government intervention is required where the market is failing to achieve equilibrium uh, what are the failures or what are the discrepancies weaknesses in a particular market opportunities threats and a general macroeconomic concept where we'll be learning about unemployment concept of gdp concept of inflation all these things will be covered in these portions again not with that very difficult yet conceptually it has to be very strong from day one secondly you can get lot of theoretical questions from this particular portion and graphs are also there a lot in this portion right then lastly we'll move to something which is uh, not very interest not very uh, numerical uh, portions are here uh, so basically we'll be talking about macroeconomic theories what is macroeconomic theories you might have heard about keynesian model some of you might have heard about keynesian model so that is one particular type of a model we'll be learning classical theory we'll be learning about neo classical we we'll, so we'll be learning different branches of macroeconomics now these theories sometimes get a little difficult or maybe sometimes gets a little boring for some people i will try to make it very interesting for you all and as i said that these classes will not be for more than one hour because even i get bored teaching these topics and even you will get bored after just one hour so i'll keep it very short 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 classes every day so that you study go back home read the compiler and you are done right so that is what we are going to do microeconomic theories and policies this is your last uh maybe 16 to 23 so there are in total 23 chapters out of which out of which chapter 2 and chapter 23 these two chapters are very basic theory or maybe summarizing chapters this chapter we will not be doing right now 
when we are doing chapter 1 to 9, we'll be skipping chapter 2. Then we are starting with this portion, part 3, then we'll refer back to chapter 2, right? And chapter 23 is basically summary of the entire CB2, what you have done, right? So there are in total 23 chapters. It's not a very short syllabus, right? That is one thing which you have to keep in mind whenever someone is saying that you can cover, cover uh, CB2 in an entire month, you can do that. But for that, you have to study for full, full days. Then only you can cover the syllabus in one month. And maybe then you can just clear the exam. You will not get good marks. That is one thing for CB2. You have to be on track from day one. And even if you're giving just two hours or maybe one and a half hours every day, you can easily clear this paper. Right? Okay, so this is the entire uh, paper structure. Now, how you will study is that in my class, I will just, as I'm using this whiteboard, I will be using this only. I will not be using the compiler. I will not be opening that compiler here. That is what you have to do back at home. Here, you will just uh, have to listen to me what I'm saying very nicely. All right. Make sure you all just keep that in mind and after the class, read the compiler. That's done. You don't have to make any notes. Keep your compiler open. Maybe you are just writing some pointers. That's it. Nothing else you have to do in my class. Right? So it will be very simple for you all in that particular way. So this is the entire paper structure and what you will study. Now we'll start with the very first chapter. So we are actually referring to a book known as John Sloman Economics uh, for Business. I have written that in my first page of compiler. What I have done is I have taken some important portions from that particular book and also my own points. So you don't have to refer to that book, right? Because it's a thousand page book. If you're reading that book, it will take you two months to read the entire book. So you don't have to refer to that book any uh, in any way. You just have to read what I've done in my compiler. That's it. There are a few additions which has happened recently in this attempt for CB2. New crypto, there are few topics on cryptocurrencies. Uh, then I think uh, a few portion of Chinese economy, some just one or maybe one or two pages are there. So these additions are there, which I'll be adding on in my compiler, which if you have received a compiler, it's not there in the compiler. I'm saying this on day one. I will be giving you a PDF because it will not be more than 10 pages, right? So I will be giving you a PDF for that. Uh, 10 pages so you all can just refer to the new additions which are there which has happened for this term only right okay so now let's start with the first chapter chapter one which is economic concepts and systems very very simple you don't have to uh, write anything you all just have to answer what i'm saying and if any one of you is feeling sleepy early in the morning you all can leave the class the video will be uploaded you can easily go back and later on you can uh, see the class because please don't feel sleepy in my classes if you are feeling sleepy i will also sleep all right so let's not do that so we'll start with chapter one which is economic concepts and systems very interesting very very basic now firstly now firstly this entire thing which you are seeing over here is known as macroeconomics. What is macro? Macro is the whole picture, economy as a whole. When uh, Gav Narendra Modi is making a decision, he is making a decision for the entire economy, right? For the entire Indian economy, right? When Mamta Banerjee is making a decision, she is making a decision only for West Bengal, right? So macroeconomics is economy as a whole, where we talk about unemployment, where we talk about inflation, where we talk about GDP things which refer to the entire economy right it affects the entire economy then inside this it's a subset that we call as microeconomics now this microeconomics is individual units like I have a firm I have a small store grocery store I'm making a decision on what to buy what price I have to sell that particular product, whom I want to sell that product, or maybe you at a consumer level are deciding what you have to purchase from which company or from which store you have to purchase at what price you are willing to pay for that particular product. So this comes within microeconomics, individual units. So the word that we use over here is individual units, decision making units. Now, why I'm saying decision making units? There are producers and there are consumers. A producer is making a decision on what to sell or what to produce. A consumer is making a decision on what to consume or buy. When I am saying I want to have puchka, you might want to have a packet of chips. So it depends on you. It's your decision what you want to consume, what you want to 
purchase right now the this this is basically this microeconomics this affects the production of goods and services and distribution of those goods and services so this microeconomics this will affect what this will affect consumption or maybe production of goods and services you can say production and consumption of goods and services and also the distribution of these goods and services so macroeconomics micro first nine chapters deals with microeconomics then after that so the major chunk of the entire syllabus is macroeconomics right and it is an interesting portion to study now one problem which all of us face is what problem of anyone very good problem of scare city now what is my handwriting is very good but i don't know why what is that problem of scare city suppose i am getting a pocket money of what is a pocket money pocket money suppose i am getting a pocket money so i used to get vanshik okay vanshika is saying she gets pocket money of 1000 so i when i was in college i think i also used to get somewhere around 1000 or 2000 i can't remember and so that is my entire monthly pocket money which i am getting now it is up to me my wants are very high i want to go for a lavish breakfast i want to go for a you know good movies i want to go and purchase good cosmetics all these my my needs are my needs and my wants are unlimited unlimited but my resources are but my resources are limited so this is known as problem of scarcity for which the entire world is fighting on an individual and on a macro level clear this is the problem on the basis of which the entire concept of economics is standing problem of scarcity if this problem is not there for example assume whatever you need whatever you want everything is fulfilled by doremon for example do you think we'll be sitting here and discussing economics do you think russia will be having a war with ukraine no it's all about limited resources unlimited wants and needs everywhere anywhere you go right so this problem of scarcity is the entire base of the entire world of economics right okay so now this is the problem now how people are dealing how economists are dealing with this entire problem there is something called as efficiency there is something called as efficiency so what is efficiency what is efficiency efficient we'll be talking about different uh, efficiencies so firstly uh, there are there is something called as three different words that we'll be learning firstly we'll be learning about economic efficiency economic efficiency so when i say uh, efficiency it is fully and efficiently employing my all resources for example when i'm getting 2000 rupees every month i will employ that 2000 fully and efficiently because my resources is very limited so i will try to employ that i will not unnecessarily spend that 2000 into something which i don't want clear clear so i will properly fully and there are two words fully and efficiently utilize the entire resource which i have why fully i will fully utilize that 2000 maybe i will spend some i will save some for my future needs and wants right so i'm fully utilizing and efficiently utilizing the entire resources now what is this efficiently efficiently generally means that um it's a situation where the goods are produced at the minimum cost and it satisfies the maximum benefit of the producers and both producers and consumers minimum cost maximum benefit right or satisfaction so there are two different branches or maybe two different uh, sub parts of economic efficiency one is your productive efficiency and one is your allocative efficiency right so what is productive efficiency productive efficiency is when the producer is producing at the minimum cost 
at the minimum cost and tries to get maximum output or profit right that is productive efficiency when a firm is trying to produce at the minimum cost given resources and trying to get maximum output from that limited given resources right this is productive efficiency what is allocative efficiency what is allocative the word allocative that my current combination my current combination of goods produced current combination of goods produced or sold gives me maximum level of satisfaction maximum level of satisfaction here the words here the word distribution comes in when so basically you might have heard about this thing a lot there are some economists who actually believe in fair distribution of income so they are against this um, you know uh, unequal distribution of income there are maybe just 1% of the people in the entire world who actually owns more than 50% of the resources right right you all will agree with this there are there is just maybe less than 1% who actually owns in fact more than 90% of the entire uh, resources right so there are some economists who are against this unfair distribution but there are economists who support this unequal distribution because they say that the people the 1% people who actually own 90% of the resources they are able to utilize these resources fully and efficiently which other 99% people are not able to right so there are again different branches of theories and different economists who believe in different things so this allocative efficiency is basically acha for me i am a consumer for me how will i employ allocative efficiency that 2000 rupees i am properly allocating in my travel expenses my food my shopping everything this is known as and i am getting after this allocation i am getting maximum level of satisfaction so for me it will be different from yours for example i want i like shopping so i might uh, uh spend 1000 in shopping for you you don't care about shopping you are you are spending 1000 in food maybe right so it depends upon you what is your level of satisfaction so that is allocative efficiency both of these things together will give us what economic efficiency and this is what we try to reach when we have problem of scarcity if we don't have the problem of scarcity then no point in sitting here and discuss right so this is one thing which we have to keep in mind now there are some keywords given to you in this first chapter you don't have to go through the entire keywords because we'll be referring to this in the entire syllabus so i'm not going through some key some key terms are given to you so no point in discussing all that when we'll be doing in the next chapters now the thing the other thing uh, over here is that there are a few factors of production factors of production you might have done this in your class 11 and 12 now you might have done four factors of production in cb2 we have three factors of production one is your labor labor is basically your human uh, form of production which involves mental and physical labor both clear generally it's mental mental physical both then the second one is your all right second one is your capital or something which we called as manufactured resources right something which we call factories factories uh computers all right these are manufactured capital is uh, not your money that is not capital capital is manufactured capital resources and lastly we have land and labor which is generally known as uh, sorry land and um raw materials which we generally called as call as natural resources right natural resources these are known as this is basically human resources and this is natural resources capital is your manufactured there are three different factors fop factors of production which is utilized in the process of production all right three different factors of production land land and raw materials labor and capital three different factors of 
introduction you might have studied one more thing known as entrepreneurship right which we don't actually refer to in two which may be falls under labor which may be again falls into capital also right so these two things we don't create a sub part for uh, entrepreneur so this is known as your three different factors of production now how will you define scarcity scarcity is unlimited human wants and limited resources right so when i'm discussing these few important jargons or few important words make sure you keep this in mind and when you read the entire material you will obviously have to read the definition properly because each word is very important in our definition in economics you cannot miss even a single word when i am saying given resources you have to write that given resources word right you cannot skip even a single term when we are talking about different uh, jargons or different uh, terminologies all right so next thing is opportunity cost we'll be doing opportunity cost in the next class so you might have heard about barter economy barter system so earlier what used to happen is suppose i am giving you 1 kg of rice so that you are giving me 2 kg of cotton for example so this was a barter system which we followed earlier in earlier days where there was no concept of money which again we'll be discussing in the later half of the cb2 syllabus now when we talk about full employment of resources and growth why do you want to have full employment of resources because obviously the resources are limited so we want to fully utilize all the resources which we have and efficiently utilize all the resources which we have now why do we always talk about growth anyone why do we always talk about growth why do we talk about growth you know you know the answer why do you talk about growth why do you want to go and work for a company why do you want to change your company for a higher salary why why growth to satisfy your wants to satisfy your unlimited wants you will have to grow and how can you grow by efficiently and fully employing your resources clear so why a nation wants to grow its output wants to grow its gdp because they want to satisfy why do you think russia is you know having a war with ukraine or any particular country is actually going to invade another country because they want the resources because they want that par right because they want to grow so if output grows more and more wants and needs will be satisfied for example here you are just getting 2000 of pocket money if you are working in a company you have your own salary which you can obviously utilize for your own wants and needs right so this is one thing now what happens in a general economy which we'll study later there are some phases where we are experiencing growth there are some phases we are where we are not experiencing growth maybe a decline in output that is known as recession so there is a boom there is a recession so this is known as a business cycle that we'll be learning in the next uh, coming classes right so why growth is important to satisfy the unlimited human wants you can never satisfy all the wants can you satisfy no one can satisfy their unlimited wants and needs i at least don't know anyone who can actually right so you always have to grow right that is one thing now uh, <clears throat> another topic which we'll be discussing today is your what is main so because we have unlimited wants because we have limited resources so we have to decide a few things before allocating the resources if what resources you should buy so these are known as main main economic or maybe main you can say main micro economic choices main micro economic choices the very first the very first choice or decision that we have to make the very first choice or decision that we have to make is what goods and services what goods and services needs to be produced or consumed produced or consumed clear what goods and services so i am having only 2000 rupees how should i spend on what 
goods should I spend this 2000 rupees if I have a firm I just have two employees I just have a given budget how should I use this uh, two employees which I have what goods or items should I sell what goods or items should I produce clear from a firm's point of view so that is why we are calling it micro level choices individual level of choices these are individual level your decision what to buy what to produce right now when you say what to buy what to produce you can also say in what quantity to buy that particular good so suppose I want to uh, go for shopping what should be my quantity that I have to invest in shopping 1500 700 depending on your given resources clear clear this is the first micro level individual choice which I make the second question over here or second decision is how these goods and services they will be produced how these goods and services will be produced or consumed or what resources should I use so for example when we talk about um, let's say suppose uh, there is a um, textile manufacturer right now what or how they want to produce a particular uh, maybe cloth do they want to use capital intensive when I say capital intensive do they want to use factories and proper machines or they want to use laborers right so what resources I want to utilize will it be my capital resources or will it be my labor resources and how I want to produce or how I want to consume from where suppose a consumer level at my consu I know I so what I have decided uh, what I want to buy right I have decided what I want to buy now I will have to decide how will I buy will I buy it online will I go in for the offline store and buy from there right at a producer level I have decided I want to be a textile manufacturer I want to produce this particular uh, cloth and at what quantity now I will decide what and how I will produce this particular what all resources I will use in producing this particular cloth clear what techniques I want to use to produce this particular cloth lastly and the last decision is for whom you want to produce this particular goods and service for whom you want to produce this particular goods and service for example if I am making a text if I am a textile manufacturer do I want to export it or do I want to produce it for my own country if I want to produce it my for own country I will charge it accordingly if I want to export it I will charge it accordingly clear so basically here we also talk about distribution and here we also have things like fair distribution and all these things so there are different forms different structures of economies who actually you know decide on how these things will be distributed and when we, when we are saying that there are different structures of economy or maybe different economic systems there are different economic there are different economic systems what are different economic systems anyone what are different economic systems one is something called as command economy command economy where the government or the state makes the decision like China government will decide what needs to be so basically these decisions these micro level economic decisions who all will who have the right to make these decisions in case of a command economy the government will tell you that you are a textile textile manufacturer and you will have to produce this particular type of a cloth cloth and you will have to produce it using capital intensive uh, technique and you will have to export it so all the decisions are made by the state by the government for you these micro level decisions are made by the government for you then we have free economy where where people or the individual decision making units they themselves decide and generally here market forces will act market forces of demand and supply 
these two things will decide what I want to buy, what I want to produce, at what price I want to buy, at what price I want to sell, which is your free market like US. And then we have something called as mixed system. Generally, you can take India to be an example of mixed economy, which is a mixture of two. Why India in some cases like railways? So railways, government is deciding for you at what price you will travel, where all you can travel. That is also, you cannot straight away uh, take a train from Calcutta to Ladakh. You will have to first go to Delhi and then from Delhi there is a flight to Ladakh. Right? So, government is deciding where all you can travel, government is deciding at what price you can travel and how you can travel. That is what government is deciding for you. Right? Now, in case other situations, maybe uh, do I want to purchase this particular water bottle, all these decisions are made by me. So, it's a mixed economy, you can say. Generally, most of the countries in the world are mixed economies. There are only a few. China, for say, is an example of command economy clear where they are making our decisions right decisions which has to be made by individual all right three different systems of economy okay now uh, <clears throat> let so today's last topic so it's a very i am taking this class this is a very light class because it's your first class then you all will the level will increase obviously with time so now the last Topic actually for today is where we learn about the circular flow, circular flow of income. Very, very basic, very, very simple. Circular flow of income. Here we'll be just talking about two sectors of an economy. What are the sectors? When I say producers, it's a sector of an economy. Consumers are a sector of economy. Government is a sector of economy. External economy is maybe out of the economy, external world, foreign world, right, which deals with export and imports, that's also a sector of economy. So these are different sectors. Banks or financial services are a system, are a uh, sector of, a, of an economy. Here, so these and as and when we'll move ahead, we'll keep on adding different sectors in our uh, this circular flow. Firstly, today we'll be starting with just two basic sectors, producer and a consumer so maybe we can say the uh, we can call this as the productive sector right the productive sector or the firms or the firms and the second one is your consumers or generally the consumers are households all right owners of factors of production or you can call them call them as well or household well, generally we don't call them as house a very uh, not a good word actually or owners of factors of production or consumers and there is productive sector who are the firms right two different sectors later on as we move ahead we'll be adding government we'll be adding adding uh, external world, we'll be adding product uh, for uh, banks, all these things, right? So here, uh, the first thing which we have to know is that the productive, so the owners of the factors of production, they will provide what? Factor services. What are these factor services? Land, labor, capital, right? This uh, center where you are sitting in, this was owned, this land is owned by someone else, right? So we have taken land from them. The, the factories, so that land is for of someone else. I have taken that rent, land or maybe rent, right? Or maybe I have purchased it, whatever the case is. So the, these are maybe the owners, these are maybe the owners of factors of production from whom we are taking what? Factor services. From whom we are taking something called as factor services. What are these services? Land, labor and so on capital and so on clear now when i'm the productive sector or the firm is taking up these factor services in return what are they giving you in return what are they doing out of from these what are they giving you factor income factor 
income so when i say factor income for land you will get rent for labor you will get wage or salary correct for capital you will get interest and for entrepreneurship you will get profit right so what are the different factor incomes rent wages interest and profit so generally broadly these are the factor incomes and there are many more broadly we classified into four categories rent wage interest and profit clear all right now the productive sector the productive sector what they do is they provide you with they provide you with goods and services they provide you with goods and services and when they are providing you with goods and services what are they in turn getting income or maybe for you it's an expenditure for you it's an expenditure clear this is known as circular flow of income this is known as circular flow of income <clears throat> now what are the micro level economic decisions which the productive sector will produce uh, make is what type of factor services do i want do i want capital do i want labor and in what form i want to give you the income will it be wages wages will be it in the form of maybe money or maybe non monetary forms right so that is what the firms are deciding owners of capital they are deciding do i want to give my land on rent do i want to provide my labor for a particular firm so that is what the owners of fop is deciding now at the same time owners of F fop are deciding on what things do i want to uh, uh, spend my given resources and similarly the productive sector is deciding what all goods and services do i want to produce and sell clear this is known as the entire and now you can say yes some part of owners of factors of production or consumers is also known as household clear any doubt till here any doubt so basic economic concepts you have covered there is a word called opportunity cost which we'll be talking about more in tomorrow's class right so in whenever we have it next day so here circular flow of income and different economic systems we have different micro economic choices factors of production and economic efficiency very very important jargon and problem of scarcity these are the different topics that we have done today and it's a very very basic you all can go down, go and just read maybe first four five pages there are a few key words key terminologies given mentioned in your first chapter all terminologies you don't have to read because that is what we are going to do in the coming classes not today right uh, let me also cover because we have some time left we can also cover i think um opportunity cost what's it let us cover opportunity cost okay very something which will be learning and using but opportunity cost so what is opportunity cost because when will other students receive material hardik you will uh, if you have read, uh, registered for the course uh, today or maybe day before yesterday you will get it in another form so whenever you have registered in 4 5 days you will get the material 5 6 days maximum so opportunity cost and those who haven't received it yet don't worry what i am doing right now in class is very basic so whenever you get you can go go back and read it's fine right no problem just listen to what i am saying very very carefully now firms and consumers they both face a choice of they both face different choices they both have to make different types of decisions between different activities what to produce what to consume on different what different types of goods i should i pr produce what different goods should i consume right so opportunity cost of any activity opportunity cost of any activity is measured in terms of the next best alternative right it's measured in terms of next best opportunity so for example opportunity cost of putting money into somewhere maybe savings account it will be measured as your 
uh, next best alternative for example instead of putting my money in my savings account i am using that money to purchase shares for example or investing in mutual funds so if i for example i have 2000 rupees i am putting that 2000 in my savings account what is the opportunity cost of putting my money in savings account not cost of not buying shares in mutual funds clear for example i'll i'll take an example in the next class i'll make a nice example for you all for example i have <clears throat> 10 hours all right i have 10 hours with me and there are different things which i can actually do with it firstly i can sleep the very first thing which always comes in my mind i can sleep right kuch nahi hai karne ko so jao we can sleep right or or hat eat 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 is not very good binge watch binge watch movies or anything whatever you like friends whatever you watch next thing study ba study is coming in the third number play play follow play play party with friends enjoyment extra curriculars whatever right so now all of these things all of 10 hours is actually too much let me keep it as 5 hours okay i can sleep for 5 hours okay so uh, i have 5 hours i cannot study for 5 hours right okay so here for example sleeping for 5 hours will give me a uh, 20 level 20 units of satisfaction 20 units of satisfaction now this is what I this is my perspective your perspective might change binge watching will not give me binge watching might give me 10 units studying will actually give me 30 just just visualize if you're studying for five hours it will actually give you the highest level of satisfaction at the end of the day right right but this is something which we don't do but it will give us highest level of satisfaction and playing will maybe give me 25 units of satisfaction this is what i am saying for you it might change so okay don't fight now here for example prerna is going for sleep all right prerna is going for sleep so sleeping for five hours what is the opportunity cost of sleeping for five hours i want all of you all to answer in the chat box Who is this nap guy? Nap guy? What is your actual name? Jay. What is this nap guy thing? It's a online game name. Nap guy. Full name. Nap guy. Okay. So opportunity cost and this was a question actually which which came in cb1 actually so opportunity cost this term is very important for all of us to understand uh, because it is used not only in cb2 it is actually used in cb1 it is actually used in cm2 so it's a word which we all should understand very nicely five hours of sleeping which gives me 20 units the opportunity cost of this will be actually studying 30 units of sleeping by because what did I say opportunity cost of doing a particular activity is measured in terms of next best alternative when I'm saying next best alternative what is my next instead of sleeping I could have done binge watch I could have done studying I could have done playing right but I chose this thing so what is the next best alternative studying best no next best if i am sleeping if i am sleeping what is the other best alternative which i could have done which would have given me the highest level of satisfaction 
Suppose if you are investing in a savings account which is giving you 4% of return and if same money was invested in equities for a year it would have given you 20 or 10% of return for example and savings in mutual fund is giving you 7% of return. So savings in equity, investing in equity is actually the next best alternative cost of next best alternative. Clear? Clear to everyone? This concept if you clear this concept from day one you will never face difficulty related to opportunity cost in anywhere you go. So sleeping for my five hours is same for all right I will sleep for five hours or I will binge watch for five hours or I will study. I'm not talking about allocation I'm not talking about two hours of sleep and three hours of study. I'm talking for entire five hours what I will do. So entire five hours if you're sleeping right and you are getting 20 units so highest unit is 30 you could have got that 30 units by studying. So the cost, the opportunity cost of sleeping is the cost of the or the benefit of the next best alternative which is studying. Why do we call as opportunity cost? Because this is something which you are losing out. If you are sleeping, you are losing out 30 units which you could have got by studying. That is why it is known as. Here. For example, now Prena decides. For example, now she decides. Now she decides to go for study. Alright? Something has really motivated her and she is going for studying. So now what is the next best alternate? Play 25 units. Play 25 units. If she decides to binge watch again studying. Anything which gives you the highest level of satisfaction. Or highest level of return. Which you are. Which is foregone. Or it is an alternative which you haven't chose. Clear? Foregone. The word foregone is important. The word best is important. The word alternative is important. Clear? Is it clear to everyone? This was a question which came in CB1. Uh, not directly but they used the concept of opportunity cost and that was one of the most difficult questions which came in CB1. Not in CB2. CB2 if you understand this concept of opportunity cost you will actually be able to solve a lot of questions properly. Clear to everyone? Sejal now you understand why it's not 5. You don't have to subtract anything. You don't have to subtract 30 minus 20 or something like that. No. It's clearly the cost of the next best alternate or the benefit of the next best alternative which you are getting. Clear? You all can copy down this particular exam. Not there in the compiler. You all can copy down this. <coughs> so from tomorrow uh, we will be actually working more on opportunity cost and we will be learning something called as PPC curve, production possibility curve. From next day, please carry your compiler if you all have, if you all received it. I don't want you all to make any notebooks for C. Not required. Okay. If you want to, you all should, if those who are appearing in the July attempt, for those who are appearing from IFO anyways, it's online. And for July attempt, it's online. So please start typing from day one only. Right? Whenever you are writing any answers, type it, on, type it on. Because here we don't have any numericals. We, ha we have numericals but we just have maybe very small portion. Very, very, very small portion. So from day one, if you have... Because the only thing which is difficult in CB2 is typing. Why? Because the entire paper is typing. So no word limit. No word limit. That I will guide you. Maybe for a 10 mark question, we write two pages. Two full pages or maybe one and a half pages. For 2 marks, it's 1 paragraph or 2 points. For 4 marks, it's half a page, a little bit more than half a page. For 6 marks, it is 1 page. Clear? So generally, that is the content that we write and generally the only thing which I hear from all the students is uh, time kamtha. Right? This is the only thing. <coughs> yes?
raw material so her question is uh, someone uh, so someone has a denim industry denim factory so the raw the cloth will be purchased from some another producer so that is a raw material for that particular form ha so ha so it depends like it depends on the situation for example when we are talking when we are in the macro level when we are talking about uh, when we are calculating the gdp in such cases we'll be using it as a raw material right here you might call it as a manufactured good as well so you can keep it within capital so the, obviously as i mentioned entrepreneurship it will not directly fall into labor or it will not directly fall into capital but still we categorize these three different main categories uh, the entire factors of production so your the cloth can be within raw materials also it can be within capital also doesn't matter doesn't matter <clears throat> All right. So, anything else? Is it is it clear to everyone? Any any questions for today? Now, what I want those who have the compiler read the first pages, or maybe you all can just relax for few days. Then, when we complete the chapter, you all can refer back and catch up. Right? Ah, uh, ma'am, do we have to watch simultaneously? no i will guide you vanshika now for now you don't have to watch any other all right so thank you so much our next class is on thursday and we'll be finishing this chapter actually bye bye